Good morning. Good morning. Oh, need this again. <clears throat> Good morning. morning. That's better. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Williams. Um, it's good to see you all this morning in your Sunday best and your Sunday smiles. Let me see you. Um, if you would, grab your bulletins. Now, if you're visiting this morning, you get to do something really fun. Look to the end of your pew. There should be a little sheet of paper that says welcome. Um, it's long and slender. You could just answer those questions on there and drop it in the offering plate when it comes your way in a few minutes. That would be great. We would like to have a record of your visit. All right, there's a lot going on at Williams, but let me highlight a few things. Look there on the um, inside your bulletin, opportunities for the week. Right after the service this morning, there will be a recreation committee meeting. I mean, I believe that you will be meeting in the library, okay? <coughs> Tuesday, we have baccalaureate here in our sanctuary at 7 o'clock. So we have two of our graduates that will be a part of that. So y'all come on, be a part of that, 7 o'clock. Um, Wednesday night, we will not have service due to baccalaureate and a lot of stuff going on this week, graduation. So uh, you can spend that time as you wish. But youth will be meeting, doing some fun stuff at 6.30, okay, just so you know. And like I said, other things going on, make sure you read that. Um, front, middle, and back. Upside down if you can, doesn't matter. Alrighty, so now it's time to stand up, find someone's hand to shake, a neck to hug, a cheek to kiss. Go. Good morning again. It's good to see you all here this morning on this Trinity Sunday, which I'm sure you all had that marked on your calendar. Not that is what today is, but today is the day in the church calendar traditionally reserved as Trinity Sunday when we reflect on that great mystery of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But as we've come together this morning for worship on this special day, on this Sunday as we've gathered, let us begin our time together with a word of prayer. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, as we have gathered here in this place for worship this morning, we trust, God, that you have gathered with us. That you are here in our presence. That you came into this place with us, and out from this place, Lord, you will go with us also. But in this time that we have set aside for worship, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us through the words of song, the words of scripture, the words that we pray for and with one another. And Lord, may we hear your voice. And may we heed your call to be your hands and feet in this world. Be with us, Lord, in this time of worship. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Nikki will... Come now. Okay, um, earlier I mentioned that baccalaureate is this week, graduation. So this is the Sunday that we recognize our graduates. So to be recognized, you must come up in front of everybody. So if you have graduated in the past year, um, received your bachelor's or master's, or you may come up here. Um, and if you're graduating this Thursday, 
you can come up here as well. So come on down to the front. bless their lives with goodness and love. And <coughs> God, every decision that they make and the passions that they follow, may you please help to walk with them and give them faith and hope and great love. And then we pray. Amen. 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 Today's uh, scripture call to worship is the eighth psalm. <clears throat> o Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, Morf mortals that you care for them, Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Sing this chorus with us, would you? 247 if you need it.
listen to the choir as they sing this great old hymn of the church. You're more than welcome to sing along with us. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. GPS is? Yes. Yes, I figured you did. You know, some of us older ones, we don't always know what a GPS is. What it, do you know what it, can you tell me what it is? Mm. What's a GPS do? Y'all know what a GPS does? You might have a GPS, like thing that sits in your, well, well, I'm sorry, that would be old school, wouldn't it? <laughs> if they sit in the window. Now they're in the car and they're like on the, on the screen. A GPS tells you like if you need to go somewhere and you don't know where to go or how to get there, you know, used to we just write out directions and, oh, you turn by this big fat tree or you go to Mr. Green's and you take a left at the flashing light. That's how, that's how, I, give, <laughs> that's how I give directions. I use, but the GPS is specific. It tells you exactly where to go. If you type it in there and you have to type it, or, or if now you can tell Siri, where's the Venus? And Siri will tell you how to get to a Venus, right? We already know. You already know. Okay. <laughs> well, I figured you did. A GP, the GPS tells us where to go and how to get there. If you ever go on vacation and you're down there and you can type it in and, and you go there, and it tells you what roads to turn on. Now, sometimes the GPS will take you on the scenic route. Like my dad likes to go on the scenic route and we'll get, go places and you think, oh, and I like the scenic route now too that I'm a little older. It's kind of fun to see the, the new places, but. GPS will do that sometimes and take you the, they'll take you the main roads. But out here, sometimes when you put it in the GPS, the GPS will have roads, the old names of the roads. You're like, what road is that? And it's the actual, it's Harold Boozer or Nesbitt Lake, but it's a, the old name of a, of a road. Well, think about it this way. Today, Mr. Chris and this week is the Trinity. And the Trinity is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. They all are together. 
And our GPS, when we're, we're living our daily life, there's lots of things that, that we use to maybe find our way. Sometimes we use our feelings. Sometimes we use other, like our friends and our family to tell, help us point the way. And sometimes that can be a good thing, but there are times that, especially if we use our feelings, that can be a not so good thing. Because if we always just go on our feelings, our feelings may not be what God's trying to tell us to do. So our GPS, a good way to know what we should do when it comes to right and wrong and how we should treat our friends and how we should treat our family and what we should be doing is to lean on the Holy Spirit, which is, which is God, he, that Holy Spirit that he gives us. And that's a great way to know what I should be doing and where I should be going and how I should treat other people because God calls us to love no matter what. He calls us to love, and he can direct us anywhere. What do you think? What do you think our map is? If we're listening to the Holy Spirit, what, what would we use for our map? What's that book we might use for our map? Um, this is dirty. Well, okay. Y'all know what that book is that we might use for our map? What's that book sitting right up there? What's that big book? It's a Bible. It's a Bible. That's right. That would be our GPS. If we're trying to figure out ways to go, and, like and, and it is like a map. And there are maps in there, and it shows us. So I hope that y'all remember that when you're thinking about if I need to you're make it. If I make a decision and what I need to do, that I might open that Bible and listen to the Holy Spirit to guide me where I need to go. Okay? You might need to go somewhere. You might. All right, let's pray, and then I'll send you guys to Children's Church. Can All I right. say it? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, for these graduates and the accomplishments that they've made. Lord, for these children, I just ask that, um, that the Holy Spirit would guide them. As, as you guide us on a daily basis and that they would be able to hear your voice as they're learning what to do and, and what they should be doing. Lord, I thank you. We love you. And we ask, ask all these things in your name. Amen. All right. Y'all go have fun at Children's Church. <clears throat>
Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for every person that's in this house today, your house. Lord, I just I, I thank you that each one of them, for whatever reason, have they're here this morning. Lord, this is a time set aside for offering, of giving back, Lord, what you uh, have given us. <clears throat> Lord, help us to notice that more. And Lord, this morning, today, at this offering time, Lord, I ask that everyone in this room, it's not just all about the money, about what goes into these gold plates, but Lord, help us to think about this morning offering more, more of ourselves. Because, Lord, you give us all. Lord, it is more about money. It's about ourselves along with it. Lord, be with us the rest of this day. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit comes here today and touches all of us. Or maybe even touch just one. In Christ's name, amen.
uh, the second song he played in that medley was How About Your Heart. I haven't heard that song in a long time. What a great question. Probably written back in the 30s and 40s. Thank you, Sean. I guess we're going to have to get him a leather piano, too, if he's going to start filling in. <laughs> um, here's a song that was written just a few years ago, and I thought it would be perfect for right before the sermon. talks about that GPS that Rhonda had mentioned and those ancient words from the only book that God ever wrote. I love this song. Listen. sing it every Sunday maybe before and so that was great and then the Sean our Swiss Army knife over here 
Um, you want to preach next Sunday? <laughs> Thought I'd try. And so, well, this morning we'll be listening to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15 there in that book, in those ancient words that Pat led us in so wonderfully to sing about. In John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it. To you. May God add God's blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Great God, Creator, Redeemer, and Friend, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to us now through these ancient words. Impart unto us what it is, Lord, that you are calling us to. And give us, Lord, in these words, strength to do it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder, have you ever taken the time to go outside at night and just look up at the stars? As the psalmist saying in the psalm that Randy read for us this morning, to just take a moment and look up. If you haven't done that, or if you haven't done it in a while, do yourself a favor. It's a clear night tonight. The moon's kind of bright, but go outside after dark, of course, and look up. I don't do that as much as I used to, but still, every once in a while, after everybody in the house has gone to sleep and the dog's got to go outside, I, I, I let her out the back door and I stand on our back deck and I just look up. I used to do this for hours. I would stand in my dad's backyard after getting off from work. I'd park my truck and get out and just stroll out in the backyard and stare up at the sky until my neck hurt. I love looking at the stars. In many ways, looking at the stars helps to keep me humble, to know my place in the universe. Because you see, if it's a clear night and the lights from town aren't so bright, you can stare into the sky and before long, you'll start to see more and more and more stars. More stars than you ever thought were possible. Places that were once pitch black begin to sparkle a little bit with a faint flicker of far off stars. And if you stare long enough, if you stand there like me long enough, if anybody drove by, they'd think I was slapped crazy. You stare up at the sky long enough, you'll even notice the sky begin to move as the earth spins on its axis. I stare up at those stars and think about how far away they are, how none of them are really anywhere close to us. They're light years away. How some of them are probably even dead now, gone, and their light is just now reaching my eyes on this planet. I like to think about how each of those stars likely has its own set of planets revolving around them. I like to think about how each of those stars is is not just, just a star, but some of them are galaxies. And they're so far away that the only way I can see their mass is a tiny little point in the blackness of the sky. I like to stand there in the yard or on the deck, craning my neck up, my eyes darting from one constellation to the next, unable to take the whole dome of the sky in at once, contemplating the vastness of the universe and how beautiful and glorious it all must be. But then I begin to feel a bit overwhelmed. And maybe, maybe I'm overwhelmed with thankfulness and the recognition that this planet on which we live is such a, a random act of creation that it really can't be random at all. And maybe, maybe I get overwhelmed with all the possibilities that exist in a universe that just is, seems so great that it can never be fully understood. Or perhaps I'm simply overwhelmed with the beauty and splendor of countless stars against a backdrop 
of nothing. Whatever it is, whatever it is that gets me overwhelmed and caught up, it doesn't take long for that feeling to subside when the dog barks at a squirrel or the heat pump pops on. <laughs> you awake now. That was unplanned. That's good. What are you doing, Mike? Let's do that again. Okay. And that heat pump pops on. It does that. It jars you back to reality. You're all sitting there counting the tiles on the ceiling. And pop. Oh, gosh. What are we talking about? It jars you back. It brings you back to reality on this planet. Back to the rhythms and realities of life. And to tell the truth, as much as I like to gaze up at the stars, I don't know much about them. I don't know their names their locations. I've forgotten most of what the constellations are. I don't know the classifications of stars and where they're at in the sky, but they still intrigue me. Their mystery still enthralls me, still captivates me. And perhaps it's that overwhelming sense of mystery that causes something within me to look up on a clear night, to not take for granted the beauty of a night sky. Perhaps it's that mystery that calls my eyes upward. And if I'm honest with you, it's that same sense of mystery that continues to drive me on in this journey called faith. Because to me, faith really requires mystery. Blurred edges, unanswered questions, doubt, paradox, thin places, the unknown and the unknowable. To me, it seems the very nature of God is found in the inexplicable mystery of one God in three persons, in the reality of God as Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an elusive mystery, this Trinitarian reality of God. And if we try to explain it, we almost always mess it up. We almost always dance with heresy. It's like trying to catch a handful of smoke. We know it's there, but we can't, can't catch it. Yet theologians have tried to put God into words for centuries. We try to put God into words. We try to put God into our own boxes and into our own images. We've tried to do that for centuries in various attempts to resolve this mystery, to dilute the tension of the mystery that is God. And yet God always stays ahead of us. The Holy Spirit always blazes on in front of us. Jesus is always out in front of us. And what is he saying? Come and follow me. Always ahead of us. I think that may be at least part of what Jesus is getting at in these words, in these words from the fourth gospel this morning. It's part of what we call Jesus' farewell sermon, and it's pretty long. He gets his disciples together and begins to teach them these things. It happens before his ascension to heaven, before his resurrection from the grave, before his crucifixion, even before his arrest. And Jesus tells them right away, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Jesus didn't tell them everything. He didn't lay it all out. Jesus didn't have the time to tell them everything, to explain it all, to put it all out there in graphs, charts, maps, and theological dissertations with multisyllabic words and annotated footnotes. Jesus hasn't given them all the answers. He hasn't given them all the right words to say, all the right doctrines to believe. There's still many things they don't know. And many things they don't know, they don't know. But Jesus tells them, you can't bear them now. Now. Does he not have faith in his disciples? I mean, can't he just say, all right, we don't have the time now, but uh, let me just get it all out there. Let me just give it to you the best I can. Does he think they can't handle the truth, the whole truth? Does he think they'll be so overwhelmed that they'll just throw their hands up in the air and say, forget this whole thing, it's too much, I don't know. That happens, you know. You try your hand at something, maybe you build a birdhouse. It comes out pretty nice, even birds live in it. And then you think, I can build a birdhouse, I'll build a dining room table. Not much difference, right? You buy the wood, you start cutting, and all of a sudden you realize, I can't do this. I'm in over my head, and you throw it all on the burn pile. You don't even have the right tools in the first place. 
Some people are, that, are the same way when it comes to their faith. They come to church, they give it a try, they pick up a Bible, they start reading, but before long, before long they're told, now this is the right way to think about this, and this is the wrong way to think about that, and this is the right thing to do, and this is the wrong thing to do. You've got to believe this and rebuke that. Or someone tells them, my way of thinking is the only way of thinking, and you have to do it my way or you're not doing it the right way. It doesn't take long before they're overwhelmed, swamped with all these opinions and directions until they decide, you know what, this whole thing, just get rid of it. They throw it out the window. And they pick up right where they left off before anyone ever told them about Jesus. They just can't bear it all. And maybe that's why Jesus tells his disciples, he's got more. I, there's more to tell you. I've still got a lot to tell you. But you just can't bear it now. Maybe Jesus knows there's only so much a mind can manage. Only so much one can digest at a time. Only so much fuel that it can burn on a fire without dousing the whole thing out. It's important to point out, though, that Jesus, Jesus doesn't just leave his disciples with what he's taught them so far, right? He doesn't say, there's still a lot I've got to tell you, and you can't bear it now, but don't worry about it. No, there, there's still more to learn. Still more to do, more to be. And when it comes time for that, when the spirit of truth comes, Jesus says, they'll continue on. They'll continue to grow. Because the spirit will guide them into all the truth. Notice, notice how Jesus doesn't say, when I'm gone, you'll know everything. You'll have it all figured out. You'll be able to tell those who have it right from those who have it wrong. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll tell you everything you need to know right up front. So memorize it. Make sure you get it all down. Make sure you don't deviate from it. Notice Jesus says instead that when the spirit of truth comes, it will guide them into all the truth. The spirit isn't just some dumping of knowledge. It's an active force in the life of the disciples of Christ. Always guiding us, showing us what it is Christ would have us to do, who God would have us to be. This is why I think that John captures these words, relays these words from Christ about this triune relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in these verses. Because it's through that mysterious relationship that the Spirit guides us in the truth that can only be found in God. Now notice what I said there. The truth that can only be found in God. I think, I think we can get too bogged down with thinking that the truth is found only in a certain way of reading the Bible. Or only in a specific way of doing worship. Or only in a precise method of baptism. Or only in a particular way of praying. Or only in a particular denomination or a particular church. We can convince ourselves that our way of understanding is the right way, the only way. And then when that happens, God's only a part of it. God's only a part of the, our way. The Holy Spirit becomes little more than, than a card we play to prove a point, to justify our way of understanding the truth. We'll say, we've all heard people say it, I've said it myself, I was led by the Spirit. You ever notice when people say that, often the Spirit leads them to where they wanted to go in the first place? Jesus tells his disciples then, and us now, there's still many things we don't know. A lot of things we don't know. And if you think you don't know, or think you do know, I have some bad news for you. You don't. I don't. I tell our Tuesday group all the time, uh, when I die, and I hope, that's a long time from now, um, that on my, on my stone, I just wanted to say my name, and then right under it say, he didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't have it all figured out. So don't come asking me then. Don't come asking me now either. I mean, I'll tell you the same thing. I don't know. But there's still many things Jesus has for us to learn. To think we have it all figured out. That we know it all. Or that somehow we hold the key to understanding all of it. That while we may not know it all, we know the way to get to it all. That is nothing short of a lie. We're only fooling ourselves if we believe that. But there's good news to be found in that. The good news in that is that the reality that we don't know it all, that we don't have 
it all figured out is that we don't have to know it all. We don't have to figure it all out. We don't have to understand the detailed intricacies of an orthodox doctrine of Trinity. We don't have to try to fill in the historical gaps in Scripture. We don't have to find where we can jam the dinosaurs into Genesis. We don't have to do that. We don't have to answer every difficult question in this life. Because if we are led by the Spirit of God, there will be times when the Spirit is still way on way ahead of us. Way ahead of us. And the only answer we may have to questions we face in this world, I don't know. I don't know. And that's all right. I want you to hear me say that this morning. It is okay to say, I don't know. I don't know. Living in the tension of mystery is a part of following Jesus on this journey to bring about God's kingdom. And listen, if you're afraid you don't know it all, if, if up to this point you've been afraid that you don't know enough, well, let me tell you something. You're not by yourself. You're not. And, and if I'm honest with you, for me, I tend to feel most connected, most plugged in, most in tune with God's Spirit when I realize that I don't know it all. That I'm not supposed to know it all. That maybe, maybe my sense of certainty in some things is actually keeping me from God. That when I think I've got it figured out, that when I'm certain about something, actually what I'm doing is I'm pushing God away and saying, I don't need you. I've got it all figured out. That's what I've come to learn. That when I let go of my self-assuredness, when I come to grips with the fact that I don't know, that I'm not sure, that I just don't have it all figured out, that's most often when God moves in my life. When the Spirit's guidance and direction becomes most evident. What I don't know and the Spirit is calling me on a little further down the road. And I think, I think that may be a piece of the mystery of God as Trinity. I think that God's reality is expressed in this indescribable three-in-one relationship in part to remind us that ultimately God can only be known that way. God can only be known in relationship. God's not a, a mathematical formula. God's not a historical fact. God can only be known in relationship. You can try to prove God by, by, by citing Scripture, by pointing to the sky, by, by figuring out things, by explaining away miracles, or, or trying to figure things out. But the only way you really know God is in relationship. For that is how God makes himself known. And we are invited into that relationship to experience the fullness of God's love in relationship with God. Now, are there things we ought to know? Maybe. Are there things we still don't know that we'll never know? Of course. Jesus still says to us, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Maybe we can't bear them now. But in time... With the Spirit's guidance, we will come to understand all the things of God. The ways of God's kingdom. Or maybe we'll come to understand that we don't need to understand it. But until that day, be faithful in what you do know. Be faithful in what you do know God is calling you to. In the ways of God and God's kingdom of which we do know. Be faithful in seeking the Spirit's guidance. Be faithful in admitting you don't know what you really don't know. Be faithful in following Jesus on the journey wherever you may be along the way. Because some of us are way on down the road with Jesus and some of us are way on back behind us with Jesus. Be faithful with where you are now. And know that he's always calling you on. For as the Apostle Paul says, now, we see as in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, we know only in part, but then we will fully know, even as we have been fully known. We may not know it all now. We may not need to know it all then. But the one thing that is always there is the call of the triune God calling us into relationship, 
calling us to come and follow, calling us to guidance from the Spirit. The question is, will we listen and will we follow? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to us. Help us now, Lord, to know that we don't know at all. But there are still so many things, Lord, that we don't know. But Lord, help us to know it's okay. That you are calling us forward. That you are always ahead of us. Elusive, calling us in to deeper and deeper relationship with you. So Holy Spirit, speak to us now in our hearts, in a way of mystery. Reveal to us your presence, and Lord, may we follow. May we heed your call, and may we follow the guidance of the Spirit of truth as it speaks to us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Only trust him. 330 in your book if you need. be seated. Those of you who are visitors with us, uh, our church will be called into a brief uh, special call business meeting. Uh, you're welcome to stay or you can, uh, you are dismissed. I won't say you can leave, but you know what I'm saying. So I'm going to let Lamar, our administrator, take over.